Well, good morning, everybody. I want to welcome you out to Springfield First Baptist Church, 141 Springfield Church Road, Rogersville, Alabama, 35652. It's, uh, we've got uh, several prayer requests to mention this morning. Uh, we've already got some folks jumping online on Facebook Live, and we welcome, welcome them as well. Uh, Miss Zoe Plunk, lady I used to work with at Legacy Christian Academy, she gets, goes to the doctor on Tuesday, and let's remember her. Uh, my uncle O.B. and his wife Willie. Uh, Willie has been moved to rehab, and uh, Uncle O.B. Uh, is still in the hospital, and uh, y'all y'all remember them. Uh, Wilma Bullard is still in the hospital. Brother Larry, her husband, has got to come home doing, uh, he's improving. Miss Wilma uh, is not uh, doing well. Let's that, remember them in our prayers. Uh, Danielle Green, uh, all, all of these, O.B., Willie, Wilma, and Larry, and Danielle are all battling this virus. Danielle's been in the hospital since July, and uh, let's continue to remember her as, as she uh, battles this illness. Uh, we've mentioned this morning... Uh, the wreck victims from last week that were uh, involved with the had have been involved some some still involved with the Clements community, and uh, let's remember all the families. Uh, I think there was three people in the wreck, and all three of them died at the scene. And let's, let's remember all those families. Uh, James Elam's co-workers. Let's, let's remember them. The Swanner family. Uh, I've got a test coming up Wednesday, and Jenna's got one coming up Saturday that we need to be remembering our stuff. And y'all, y'all remember, remember us as we do those tests this week. Remember our church, those that uh, comes in and out the doors here, as well as those that uh, are watching us at home. I, I feel like they they part of our church family as well. We've got folks from uh, Washington, Oregon. Uh, up in Tennessee, Mississippi, just all over watching our services. And uh, we thank God for them. Thank God for the technology that we have to be able to do, to do that. Uh, remember our country and our state. As, uh, as we say from each week, uh, our leaders making decisions that affect our lives today and the days to come. And... Uh, this weekend uh, is Labor Day weekend, as most of us know. Uh, be a lot of folks traveling, be a lot of folks getting together. And uh, if you've been watching the news, sometimes those get togethers ain't, shouldn't have been a get together because folks don't <coughs> do what they're supposed to do. But we pray that everybody's safe as they travel, pray that everybody's uh, safe if they getting together with folks. Uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and then we'll get started with the sermon this morning. We, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be gathered as we are this morning, uh, on, both online folks that are joining us and also those that are here in person. We ask you to bless each home that's uh, gathered with us today, however it may be. And, uh, Lord, we lift these up. Lord, we've mentioned for prayer this morning. You know each and every need that, that's there. Uh, some have lost loved ones. Some have just situations, Lord, that uh, you know about, that maybe we don't know about. Some uh, are getting results from tests. Some are from medical tests. Some are taking medical tests. Some are just taking tests, just regular old test and uh, on their knowledge and lord uh, we just uh, ask you to be with each one uh, whatever their need is today and in, in the upcoming week and lord as we look to your word this morning lord just uh, give us the words that uh, we stand in need of and as we again talk about you and learn just a little bit more about you lord uh, i thank you again for this opportunity if they be one here lord today or one online that's uh, listening to us that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray that uh, through today's message, Lord, as you speak to their heart, as you knock upon their heart's door, Lord, that they'll uh, answer that with, a, with an answer of faith. And 
Lord, uh, I thank you for all the things you do for us. And again, just be with us, Lord, as we look to your word this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look this morning to the book of uh, 2 Peter, chapter number 3. And we'll start, I believe, in, yes, in verse number 18. 1 Peter, chapter number 3. And we'll be reading verses 18 through 22. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Now, as a side note, uh, Justin is working on getting the projector back up and going. And uh, hopefully, unless the delivery people are slow, hopefully, I'm just going to jump out on the limb and say, hopefully by next Sunday, we'll... We'll have everything in line. And I think the folks are sending us, instead of just one, they're sending us two. And uh, they've uh, Justin's got a different idea about how to arrange that equipment. And uh, we'll see how that goes. But hopefully by next Sunday, it'll be up and going. So let's read verses 18 through 22 of First Peter chapter 3. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just... For the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The light figure whereunto even baptism does now save us, not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven, is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So uh, particularly the first part of this, section of scripture my Schofield Bible has a title there and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about what some of this means uh, he's uh Schofield wrote it in parentheses here but it says the vicarious suffering of Christ preached by Christ through the spirit of, in Noah now uh, we'll get to that here in just a minute because apparently Schofield believed that uh, Christ wasn't the one literally doing the preaching, but uh, he influenced Noah in his day. You know, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. But uh, we're going to also look at some scripture this morning that t reminds us that Christ himself did go into hell before he ascended into heaven. And we'll get there here in just a minute. Now, that's in language that you and I understand the differences of, but uh, we'll get to that here in just a minute. So, great passage on salvation shows us what Christ did for us. If you'll look back to verse number 18. Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Who's sin? Mine. But not mine only. He suffered for your sins as well. And not for those that just tied into Springfield First Baptist Church whether you're here seated in the pew today or whether you're listening, watching online, my Bible says this, it's for the sins of the whole world. He is the propitiation of our sins, in Second John, 1 John chapter 2, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Christ died for our sins. It was the sins for the for man of man that he died for. He didn't die for his sins because he had none. But as he died on the cross, my sins, your sins, the sins of the world were placed upon him. You say, well, how, how do you know that? Well, uh, let's turn back and refresh our memory. If you'll turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, in verse number 21, last verse of the chapter, we'll be reminded about what he did for us. Let's 
Verse 21 again says, For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. And let's don't leave off them last two words. In him. It's only through him that we can be called righteous. I want to remind you about what Isaiah says. Isaiah says our righteousness is his filthy rags before him. The best that we have, the best we got, the best we've ever done on our own accord, of our own strength, is simply filthy rags before him. The only way we can be called righteous, the only way we can be called justified is through the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed upon the cross of Calvary. Uh, told you that uh, there's a word there that Schofield's got, the vicarious. Now, that's an important word. Don't know that I've ever used it till today. I've heard of it. Let's talk about what that means. Because one writer says this, Christ died vicariously. He was the one, just one, dying for the unjust, as you see there uh, in verse number 18. The just... The sinless one for the sinners. The just for the unjust. So what does vicariously mean? So this writer says it means two things. Jesus Christ is perfectly just or righteous. And he died for those that are not. Marty Mosley being a part of that. You say, well, I don't, I don't like to consider myself that way. Apostle Paul did. Apostle Paul said he was the chief of sinners. Christ died for us. The just for the unjust. He was sinless. As a man, he lived a sinless life. Therefore, he stood before God, the perfect, ideal man. The perfect. He died a sacrifice for us. Perfect. Unblemished. As we talk about and think about the sacrificial system that the Israelites had to go through. What did they have to bring? They couldn't bring anything that was lame. They couldn't bring anything that was sick. They had to bring the best that they had. And God gave us the best. Sinless, without blemish, the Lamb of God died for our sins. Jesus loves us. Therefore, he gave himself for us. Just as a reminder, we, we can quote it, but sometimes it's just good to turn over there to make sure that we remember exactly what it says. Turn over with me to John 3 and verse 16. Most everybody in here could probably uh, quote this word for word, probably even pause where there's a comma at, but let's read it together this morning. And I'll try to do my best to pause at those commas because I was taught a long time ago you could pause at them. And I was taught not so long ago that when you're singing that song got a comma in there, <gasps> get you a good breath. For God so loved the world. I want to remind you about something. Romans 5 and verse 8 says that he died for us even though while we were yet sinners that he commended his love toward us. He died in our place. The as we read there in 1 Peter chapter 3, the just for the unjust. He knows us. He knows us today. If we're saved, he knew us before we were saved. If we're here today and we're lost, he knows all about us. He knows us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Randy, I've been thinking about that story you tell from time to time. Uh, I believe it goes something like this, that if Jaron was to push somebody out of the way of a moving vehicle, that you would be giving your son for that other person's life and how hard that would be. God loved us enough that he gave his only son 
that we might live. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. A lot of times we think about what's in Lamentations chapter 3, around verse 20, 21. Is it, is it of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not? They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's why he gave his only son for our sins. That whosoever believeth in him, in him should not perish, but have everlasting life for all eternity. If you'll turn back with me to 1 Peter chapter number 3. Verse 18 again, it says that Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Our sins, our sin separates us from God. There had to be a payment for sin. Christ paid it. You think about what the Israelites went through. That time after time after time, they had to come up, give the best they had as a sacrifice. Christ did it one time. The perfect sacrifice. What a terrible thing it is to consider. And you say, well, what, what's a terrible thing to consider? That not everybody knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He died for their sin, but for whatever reason, they hadn't accepted that. One writer puts it this way. A terrible, tragic fact. Not everyone is in Christ. Not everyone believes in Christ. In fact, most, part, most people curse and reject Christ either by word or act. You say, well, where, where do they get that from? Enter ye in at the narrow way. Few there be that find it. For broad is the path that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in there at. Many, many. So few, the narrow way, many, the broad way that leads to destruction. You see, but we need to be, we need to accept what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, that his, that our sins be forgiven. Until we do that, we're living in our guilt. So he did this that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. But look at that last phrase, verse 18. But being quickened by the Spirit. Now, uh, verse 19 and 20, there's a lot of different thoughts on what exactly verse 19 and 20 is. But I'm, I'm going to dwell upon this fact in my life now. One day after a while, God might set Marty down and say, Marty, you was wrong about this, but... This is where I'm coming from this morning. There are others that don't come from the same path that I'm taking right now. Verse 18 tells us that he died, but yet he lives. And verse 19 says, by which also. Now, I'm thinking that he's still coming back to verse 18 there and saying that he died and that he lives again. By which also... He went and preached unto the spirits in prison. You say, well, where's the prison at? Hell. We'll, we'll get to verse number 20 here in just a minute. I want to refresh our memories about something in Ephesians. If you'll turn over with me to, to Ephesians chapter number 4, starting in verse number 7. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 7.
Ephesians 4 and verse 7, Paul writes to us, he says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Each one of us that are saved has a gift. And you've heard me talk about this time and time again. Are we using that gift? Is it still wrapped up under the Christmas tree, maybe, so to speak? It never been opened. We don't even know what it is. Have we sought for it? Goodness knows that when we find our name on a Christmas gift under the Christmas tree, maybe y'all ain't like me. But most of the time them things get shaken. And usually it's by me. I don't get Jenna in there and say, Jenna, would you hold that up to my ear and shake it really hard? No, I don't, I don't involve Jenna. I don't involve Anna. I don't, surely don't involve Amy. But I get in there, try to feel of it. Problem is with Amy, though, she's probably got it two or three boxes deep. And if I hear any shaking going on, it's probably that smaller box inside the bigger box that she's wrapped up to try to throw me off. But sometimes I, I can still get them right anyway. The important thing is, are we seeking and searching for the gift that Christ gave us? Let's look at verse number 8. Wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high. Now, has he ascended? Amen, he has ascended. He's seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. He led captivity captive. We'll get to that here in just a minute. And gave gifts unto men. Verse 9. Now he that now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended? And I'm going to branch out on a limb and tie this together with what Peter is writing to us in first Peter chapter 3 and verse 19. He also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now let's turn back to 1 Peter chapter 3. So Peter's not the only one that says that he descended first. But is, does everybody go along with what I said about that? No. Here's one opinion. This comes from the Keyword Study Bible, the Hebrew, Greek, Keyword Study Bible, the English Standard Version. They, they say this. The phrase spirits in prison may refer to immaterial spirits. I looked up immaterial. It says spiritual. So we could say spiritual spirits. Or it could mean they don't mean much. But I do not know a soul that is not important to Christ. So I'm not, I'm not going to go along with that definition. They don't mean much. But it could have other significance as well. The ungodly are constantly spoken of in Scripture as being in a state of spiritual imprisonment or bondage. This verse may therefore signify that Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, warned those in Noah's day who were in bondage to sin by the mouth of Noah himself, who is identified as a herald of righteousness later on in 2 Peter chapter 2 in verse 5. Or, if you so desire, a preacher of righteousness. Anyway, where does victory come from? Victory comes from Jesus, knowing Jesus Christ. I was thinking this week about uh, the number of teams, college football teams that I have watched through the years go winless. Sometimes season after season after season. But then they win a game, and what do they do? They won one game. And they're still going like this. Maybe that's signifying one game. I don't know. But those of us that know Jesus Christ have the victory already through our faith in Jesus Christ. If you look back to verse 20 of 1 Peter chapter 3,
this is where they get the idea that it's only talking about those in Noah's day. Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. You say, well, how in the world was they saved by water? I'm going to refresh your memory. I've told you this before. They were saved from the water by the water. That water got to getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and that ark they was on started floating. So they were saved from the water by the water. I'm going to go a little, a little bit further with that. You and I are saved from the fire of hell by the fire. You say, where in the world do you get that? When the Holy Spirit comes into our life, we've been baptized by fire. John the Baptist said, I baptize by water, but there's one coming after me that baptizes with fire. I hope that you and I that are saved allow that fire to have control of our life. I hope we still ain't dabbling around saying, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I choose to do. This is what I'm going to do. But what is the Holy Spirit going to do through us? That's what we need to look at. So was he only talking in the days of Noah? I'm of the opinion that when he descended, as one writer puts it, he probably reminded those that were there because they were disobedient before the flood and he reminded them that that preacher of righteousness, he had it right after all, didn't he? Noah had it right after all. I don't know this, but many time, many folks have pointed this out. Think about the number of folks that came up to that ark. Water's getting deep out here. Noah couldn't open the door. God done closed it. In this life, we don't need to get past the fact of this, that there is a moment that we can go too far. If God's grace is dealing with you today, if His mercy is extended to us today, we need to accept it today because tomorrow, tomorrow may not come. Before I was saved, I was one of them too. I'll do it next week. I'll do it tonight. I'll do it later. But I was not promised any of those times. But I'm thankful that God's grace and His mercy extended my life long enough for me to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Now let's look to verse 21. Verse 20, you remember it says, eight souls were saved by water. The light figure in verse 21, wherein two, even baptism does also save us now. I want to point out what J. Vernon McGee says about this verse. To what baptism does this refer? It is not, let me, let me say that again, it is not water baptism that saves us. Amen. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happens at the moment of salvation that saves us. What does that do? It does a lot of things, but one thing it gives us the right to do is to get in that pool of water and tell the world what God has already done in our life. It is not water baptism, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is real baptism, and water baptism is ritual baptism. 
He goes on to say, I believe in water baptism. Amen. I believe in water, ba water baptism. I believe immersion is the proper mode. However, the important thing here is to see that it is a baptism of the Holy Spirit which puts you into the body of believers. Then that makes you a candidate to come become a member of the church, the local church. And we do that by water baptism. Mine's got a set of parentheses there. Not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So if we take out them parentheses and just read what's not in parentheses, it says this, A light figure wherein to even baptism also does now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in case you didn't catch that, it's still all about Jesus. It's still all about him. Still all about him. Remember when I was ordained to be a minister, I had one waiting that needed to be baptized in water. I believe that he'd already been baptized by the Holy Spirit or else he was lost. If we don't have the Holy Spirit of God, I believe we're lost. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans chapter 8, I think verse 14. J. Vernon McGee continues on, not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh is not just by water for that will not put away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is a faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ which brought the work of the Holy Spirit into your life and regenerated you. You say, well, that was a lot of words. Well, let me break them down just a little bit further. If you turn over to Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9, it puts it as simple as I, I know it. Uh, Probably in more words than 1 John 5 and verse 12 puts it. 1 John 5 and verse 12 puts it this way. He that hath the Son has life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That, that puts it pretty plain. Either we are or we ain't. But Romans 10 verse 9 puts it this way. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. What is that talking about? It's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. If you look back to verse 21 of 1 Peter chapter 3. The light figure wherein to even baptism also doth now save us. We'll come back to those parentheses here in just a minute. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh, but to answer of a good conscience toward God. What makes us a candidate for baptism? Believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Which means this, the Holy Spirit's done showed up. He's done made to his indwelling place in our life. Then we are a candidate for Jimmy, Steve, whoever, whoever does it, to crank up this heater back here. Hey, man, I'm proud for that heater. I hope it's still working. Warm up that cold water for us to get into. But, you know, Jonna, cold water sometimes pretty good too. Because that Anderson Creek, it don't never get warm. Even in 100 degree weather, it's still cold. Now look at verse 22. Who has gone into heaven? Who has? Jesus has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Every time you see that phrase... Every time I see that phrase, I think about him being seated 
I want to remind you, though, that Stephen, Deacon Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church, he saw him, but he was not seated. He was standing at the right hand of God when Stephen saw him. And when he explained that, when he proclaimed that to those around him, they stoned him to death. Blasphemer. But Christ is seated at the right hand of God, making intercessions for us. And look, look there what the rest of the chapter says. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. One writer says, this means a most wonderful thing. Believers need never fear anything in this life. Because everything in this life is subject to Jesus Christ. What's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. But my faith is secure in Jesus Christ. Is yours? What's going to happen this next, this next week? I don't know. Is the news going to say numbers going up? Are they going to say numbers going down? Hospitalizations up? Are they down? I don't know. But my faith is in Jesus Christ. Is yours? Are we going to be able to? I don't know. But my faith is in Jesus Christ. Is yours? Again, verse 22. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Who's gone into heaven? Jesus has gone into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God. Angels, authorities, and powers being made subject unto him. Is our faith in Jesus Christ today? Or is it in other things? Other folks? How are we going to get to heaven? The only way we're going to get to heaven is to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Pure and simple. There is no other way. There is no other way. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be gathered as we are today. Thank you for Lord Jesus Christ going to the cross and dying in our place, as we talked about today. That it's not the end of his story, though, Lord. You raised him victorious over the grave. Where is he at now? That verse 22 says he's at your right hand. All these things being subject to him. And Lord, I'm so thankful today that he's there making intercession for me today. Lord, uh, you have your way in each one of our lives today. For somebody listening, may they reach out to someone and say, hey, I, I, I need to know Jesus. For someone here today that's lost, may they come today and say, Marty, I need, to know who, I need to know Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for all the things you have done for us, that you're doing for us, and that you're going to do for us. Thank you for the precious promises in your word. And Lord, again, you have your way in each one of our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As James comes with a song of invitation this morning, we'll tell our Facebook friends goodbye. And we'll be back online tonight at 6 o'clock. Y'all have a great day.